Hi everyone, my name is Mallory. I'm a Purdue University Global BMP student doing a project at Newport Hospital. And today I'm going to talk to you about the use of game-based learning in nursing staff development. I have two kids, one's five and one's almost three, and they go to preschool. In early childhood education, kids learn through self-directed play. This is a picture of them at the Cranberry Festival, playing in a tub of cranberries. And even though we had just finished listening to a cranberry farmer talking about how cranberries are harvested, they didn't remember that cranberries float. What made them remember was playing with the cranberries, not listening to them talking about it. But somewhere around kindergarten or first grade, their education is going to change. Rather than learning through play, experimentation, and exploration, they'll spend more time learning in more passive ways, such as listening to the teacher, reading, or doing worksheets. And this continues through adulthood, right? The latest education research in both the young and older learners though strongly demonstrate that active learning strategies are more effective. But despite this research and all that's changed in the world, educators are still frequently teaching as they were taught. And those of you responsible for educating nurses have to cater to three different generations, which is no easy task. A lot's changed in three generations. New generations of learners have different educational preferences and tend to enjoy using technology. Consider my children who get frustrated talking on the phone with great grandma because she can only hear them and not see them. Your recent traditional new graduates never knew life without computers or cell phones. I'm 33, I'm in the so-called Xennial generation. Instead of growing up with widely available technology, I grew up alongside it. And us 30-somethings are young enough to be comfortable with technology, but old enough to remember recording a song from the radio on a cassette tape or calling our parents from the payphone. I remember getting my first computer at about 12 years old, and along with AOL Instant Messenger and Juno Email, it had two built-in games. One was about Leonardo da Vinci, and another was about eating enough fruits and vegetables, and I can still vividly remember playing those games. I can tell you a little bit about Leonardo da Vinci's inventions if I wanted to, and I could even still sing you the jingle about getting five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. And every once in a while, these come back to the surface of my memory even 20 years later. Yet at the same time, we in nursing staff development grapple with the fact that despite completing education on a topic, what the nurses should have learned is not making it into practice. And when we ask them, they often say, what do they often say? I don't remember learning that. So why is it that a learner forgets a new policy that they reviewed a month ago, but I can remember da Vinci's flying machine 20 years later? I can tell you, it's not because I have an exceptional memory. It's an example of the power of game-based learning, which is an active learning strategy that we can leverage in staff development with our new generations of learners in particular. So our learning objectives for today are to talk about characteristics and features of game-based learning in a digital setting, the pros and cons, how learning theory supports this method, and finally some practical tips you can take with you and use in staff development. Some of you are responsible for educating staff, but all of you are stakeholders in robust nursing education. Overall, I want you to walk away from this presentation inspired to do something a little different and a little more creative with your education, even if it isn't gaming. Every single nurse in every single setting is part educator. It's a fundamental aspect of nursing care. We educate patients and their families. We educate each other. We educate nursing students. We educate new residents. The list goes on and on. And if your current role doesn't directly involve staff education initiatives, think about what we discussed today in the context of your own practice. So what is game-based learning? There are some myths about game-based learning out there. Oftentimes when people think of game-based learning, they just think about the play, and they don't think it has any substance or real learning, but there's plenty of literature out there in both children and adults that say otherwise. I completed an integrative review of the literature about game-based learning in adults, and this word cloud represents what I found. Um, the more frequently mentioned the themes, the bigger it appears in the cloud. So you can see things like engaging, fun, motivating, but you can also see educational theories, critical thinking, and problem solving. Eligibility criteria for the review were based on a PICOS format. So PICOS is population, interventions, comparators, outcomes, and study design. 
The population included registered nurses in the setting of professional development. Interventions that were included were digital media that had one or more gaming features. The game-based intervention in research studies could be compared to any non-game-based educational intervention. Outcomes could imp include improved knowledge, engagement, student and faculty satisfaction, cost-effectiveness, and translation to practice to gain a holistic view of a successful education program. In the beginning stages of exploring the topic, preliminary searches showed little literature specific to nursing education. And that wasn't at all surprising. Um, I was fully expecting that. But I didn't want to base a project on just a little bit of lower quality literature. So I had to expand my search and do a new paper statement. And here are the two compared to each other side by side. Because of the lack of robust literature, specifically about game-based learning and nursing staff development, the general education literature was also reviewed prior to the design of the project. The focus of the search was to find higher level evidence in the adult general education literature about game-based learning. The PCOS format was just slightly different. Um, it had more of a focus on higher level and quality evidence. The interve interventions, comparisons, and outcomes were the same. The population was limited only to any adult 18 years or older, and study designs were limited to synthesis, randomized controlled trials, quasi-experimental studies, and some mixed methods. K-12 through research was abundant on this topic, but it was outside the scope of this project. Uh, the K-12 through research shows robust support for game-based learning. I used the Johns Hopkins Nursing Evidence-Based Practice Rating Scale to assess the strength and quality of the evidence presented. You can see in this chart that the strength has five levels, level one being the strongest, level five being the weakest. Um, the levels are based on the type of article, so randomized controlled trials, systematic reviews, and meta-analyses are the strongest evidence, and then non-research evidence makes up the weakest. Each level of evidence is then assessed for quality high, moderate, and low based on certain traits such as, you know, are the results generalizable? And so this is what the each literature review looks like when we talk about the quality and the level of evidence. You can see that the nursing staff development literature search had mostly low quality, um, lower level evidence, while I only included the higher level and higher quality evidence in, into the general adult education search. Four recent nursing education textbooks mention game-based learning, and this information was included in the synthesis as well, but it didn't yield very much. So let's take a moment and think about a game that you once played. Um, you might think that a person doing a game-based learning presentation, a person who created a video game for teaching would be a huge gamer, but I actually am not. I haven't really played video games since the old Nintendo and Game Boy days, but I want you to think about a digital game that you've once played and think these, these thoughts through with me. What was the goal of the game? What were the rules? How did you know the rules? Were they clearly written or were they demonstrated? Was there a strategy for winning? What skills did you need to play this game? Did you need critical thinking skills? Did you need to anticipate on what's going to come next? Were, were there strategies that you used? Um, what motivated you to continue to play? Oftentimes when we're playing a game, we're motivated to play, continue playing because we want to win. Now, if you think about those skills that you needed to play this game, how do we use some of those skills in our business of nursing? And what do we currently do to support the development of those skills? And how can we incorporate a game element into our learning solutions to facilitate learn using those skills that we want people to learn? Several key themes were identified in the review of the literature. Lack of consistent definitions is a big challenge in research and game-based learning. And so you'll find all of these articles, some of them say game-based learning, some of them call it serious, serious games, some of them call them educational games, um, and they were all often used interchangeably. Um, but game-based learning was described as a game in a non-game context that accomplishes objectives aimed to educate and train, as well as produce behavioral change. The behavioral change part is actually a really interesting implication in healthcare because how often is our page, patient teaching 
geared towards a behavioral change, right? Um, so there were several studies used that used game-based learning for people with depression, anxiety, um, people with ADHD, um, kids on the autism spectrum learning social skills. And so there really is a lot of use for game-based learning, even outside the scope of, of nursing staff development or, or education in general. Another theme that was evident in defining game-based learning was the inclusion of a set of rules and a method of keeping score. Game-based learning offers an opportunity for intrinsic motivation. You remember I said before, you, oftentimes you, want, you keep playing the game because you want to win. You are driven by this desire to keep going. And that's intrinsic motivation. Game-based learning improves student engagement. It's an active learning strategy, and it can stimulate critical thinking, problem-solving, analysis, and evaluation, so those higher-level thinking skills. It's unclear what specific game mechanics contribute to the success of game-based learning, and it is an area of research that would greatly assist educators in building game-based modules successfully. Pictured here on this slide are some little uh, screenshots of the game that I made, uh, the educational game that I made. Um, and I will point out which game mechanics are pictured here as I talk about them. There's lots of different strategies included in the literature. One popular feature is the use of virtual worlds. So you can see that, that there is a picture of a hospital layout. That is the virtual world, the setting in which the game takes place. And it immerses the learner in another environment. It allows them to make mistakes in a safe place and learn from them, much like simulation does. And within the game, the learners may act out different roles. So you see <clears throat> the top picture is the nurse manager standing in front of the desk. She's introducing herself to the learner and telling them basically how to play the game and how to win. But the role of the learner in this game is a new nurse starting orientation. And so that is the role that they play out in the game. They also observe others in different roles. So you can see there's a picture below with a nurse standing at the bedside of a patient in bed. And in the game, they're having a conversation about why it's important to take his catheter out. Um, so there are, are many ways that role play is used in game-based learning. One of the other big benefits of game-based learning is that feedback is given instantly. And this is helpful for facilitating learning. The outcomes of the game are based on how the individual learner interacts with it. And so this fosters a sense of curiosity, a sense of being challenged. And there's lots of features that provide rewards to learners to foster a sense of competition, not just the score, but also something called badges. Badges give a visual, visual cue that represents an accomplishment, and that acts as a reward. So you can see in the bottom corner, those four little blue sca squares are the badges that's used in the game that I made. Leaderboards show the group of learners who the top performers are, and typically the top performers are measured by a system of scoring. So I did not use leaderboards in my game. That's why I um, showed uh, leaderboards from other games in game-based learning. The reason why I decided not to use it is because leaderboards have to communicate with an outside server, which I couldn't guarantee security. So one of the challenges of game-based learning in the hospital setting is getting stuff onto hospital computers is a challenge because we have them very secure. Um, so leaderboards just weren't going to work for that reason. But they can be a very powerful tool for motivation. And you don't even have to do them digitally. You can make leaderboards. Uh, you know, if you have a competition between units about fall rates, you can make leaderboards on a, a bulletin board. Um, achieving higher and higher levels or conquering missions or quests also prevents, provides a sense of triumph. Some platforms allow for an aspect of social interaction and teamwork. <clears throat> While the literature lacks an empirical explanation for game-based learning effectiveness, there are lots of multiple validated learning theories that are cited to explain the success of game-based learning. It, it, I know you're all very disappointed, but I'm not going to go through every educational theory that, that supports game-based learning. We would be here all day. Um, it's beyond the scope of what we're here to talk about, but I think it's worth listing them to show you how robust the support is in education theory for game-based learning. 
we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about Knowles' theory of Androgos and our doll wearing theory later on. So, of course, like any teaching and learning strategy, there's going to be some challenges. And one common complaint amongst the articles that tested game-based learning in more controlled environments was the experience of technical glitches. And as you can imagine, that was a big source of frustration for educators and learners. I'm sure you've all sat in front of your computer and wanted to pull your hair out because something just wasn't working. Uh, the same thing happens in digital game-based learning. Um, this picture is a picture of my virtual world turned completely upside down. This actually happened in pilot testing two of the people playing the game somehow got the world to flip completely upside down and we couldn't figure out why it happened, how it happened. Eventually they were able to flip it back. Um, but these are the types of frustrating things that can come up when you're using a digital platform for something. Um, some authors caution that game-based learning might be too competitive for some learners. And, but the biggest barrier to game-based learning that I found is the amount of time that it may take to plan. Uh, we'll see later that the resources that are the cheapest take the most time for you to develop, and the, the game-based learning resources that are out there where it's just drag and drop and you just click on things, of course, those are going to cost lots more money. So it's kind of hard to find the balance of time and money when, di when you're building a digital game-based learning module. And we know, you know, I did the staff development thing. This isn't my first rodeo. I know that nurse is responsible, responsible for staff development. Y'all wear many, many hats. And in my opinion, time is one of the most precious resources in staff development. Uh, so in order for this to work, uh, it's got to work for the people who are building it. The game-based learning is just another tool in education. So you, you can't lose sight of the fact that it's an educational method and you've got to start with learning objectives and use strategies that lead the learners to meet those objectives. And you've got to have evaluation strategies too. So an educational plan is still part of this, even though it's a digital game. The literature nearly universally said that game-based learning can be as effective or more effective as traditional methods, but further research is needed. Current evidence, though, is very promising. Game-based learning is not meant to replace other methods, so I'm not up here suggesting that you change all of your education to a game. It's just another tool in your tool belt that can be used to engage learners in an active way. So now that we know what game-based learning is and isn't, let's talk about some examples of how it can be done. And I'll start by showing you how I use game-based learning, and then we're going to go into talking about other ways you can incorporate digital game-based learning into your staff development program. The purpose of the project that I did was to align nursing staff development with evidence-based teaching strategies. We, um, the desire was to satisfy both the learner and the educator wanting to improve the nurse's knowledge of nurse-sensitive quality measures to ultimately improve patient outcomes. So nurse-sensitive quality measures, as we probably all know, are those quality indicators that nursing have, has a huge impact on. The three quality measures that we focused, focused on here were CAUTI, CLATSI, and FALSE. There are more, uh, but those are the only three that we're talking about here today. There was a desire to update staff development programs to reflect novel teaching strategies that are evidence-based, and desirable features of the educational program would include keeping costs low and efficiency for instructors and learners. And to do that, an e-learning platform just made the most sense. But it's tricky having an e-learning platform and keeping students or learners actively engaged. And so using active learning strategies was also a priority. We wanted to invoke critical thinking. So make, making learning interesting, fun, and effective was also a part of this. It was agreed upon that an online game-based e-learning module could be used to reach those goals. So I told you we'd circle back to Knowles' theory of androgogy. This was the theoretical framework of the project. And Knowles proposes that adults learn differently than children. He makes a distinction between andragogy or adult learning and pedagogy, which is learning with children. 
And there are a few assumptions that he lays out. And I want you, as I go through these, to think about your own learning. Think about uh, educational things that you've gone to that were really great and other things that maybe weren't so great. And perhaps these foundations of adult learning weren't addressed and the ones that weren't so great. So the first assumption is the need to know. The assumption is that adult learners weigh the benefits of knowing with a consequence of not knowing before the learning takes place. So as educators, we need to make perfectly clear why this knowledge is important and why it's relevant. The section, second assumption is that adult learners have a self-concept to be accountable for their own choices. They are they need to be treated as capable of self-direction. And when they're presented with an educational opportunity where they're taught, as they were taught as children, it can unveil sort of this conflict, sort of this resistance. The third assumption is that adult learners bring to the table a wealth of existing knowledge and experiences. And this goes along with the, educa the educational theory of constructivism, is that adults will build new learning on the, the life experience that they already have. And we know that adult experience wi widely varies. You might be teaching a brand new nurse and you might be teaching a seasoned nurse of 20 years. Uh, so we're dealing with a wide variety of experience here when we teach in nursing staff development. And so an emphasis on individualized education is especially important. Experiences make up an adult's view of his or her personhood. So it's important for the educator to appreciate those life experiences. The fourth assumption is that adults are ready to learn when things they need to learn in order to manage what's currently going on in their lives. So in a nursing standpoint, before learning can take place, the adult learners have to know how how they're going to use this in practice. The fifth assumption is that adults' orientation to learning is life-centered. Adults are motivated to learn only to the extent that it will help them in their real life. And it's critical to include how these skills are going to be used. So we're talking about here a shift from subject-centered learning to problem-centered learning. This is going to, to impact these problems in your real life. And the sixth assumption is that the adult learner responds strongest to intrinsic motivators. And we talked a little bit about intrinsic motivation while you're playing a game. You keep going because you want to. That desire comes from within. So let's talk about how game-based learning fits into all of this. Uh, this slide gives examples of qualities of game-based learning and how they can fit into Knowles' theory of Andrew or adult learning. Game-based learning supports the need to know by clearly stating the mission and showing the consequences of actions immediately and in real time. It supports the adult learner's self-concept by adapting to the learner's actions. This is a very unique benefit to game-based learning. The module's self-directed, it's self-paced, and you can tailor to different levels of experience. So you can add extra information for learners who need it and make those same things optional for the learners who feel like they can skip it. Adult learning readiness is supported when they're presented with information that they need for everyday life, so you still have to make it relevant. Game-based learning definitely leverages intrinsic motivation, where the learner's motivated from within, just because it's gratifying, not because they have to keep going. And virtual reality shows how knowledge is relevant to practice, and game-based learning allows multiple opportunities for problem solving. So I'm going to show you a video that has little snippets of the game-based learning module that I created for Newport. The learner starts by uh, hitting start by, to enter the virtual hospital. They meet their nurse manager. They, they tell them how to navigate the game. They explore the hospital. They click on hearts, going through different learning activities. And then every time they have a learning activity, they answer a challenge question about them. They earn 10 points for every correct answer and lose 10 points for every incorrect answer. And they can only move on if they answer correctly. Once they answer the challenge question, they can pick up the heart, and they've got to collect all hearts to complete the module. Whenever they click on an answer, there will always be a rationale whether or not it's a correct answer or an incorrect answer so that they can really learn. 
Um, there is also a potential for bonus content. So you can see in this, this slide that there are several items in the room that put the client at risk for falls. And if you click on those items, you can earn extra points. And so the learner can go around and click on things that puts the client at risk for falls. And this is an example of one of those extra activities that's optional. There are several other examples of how content is delivered. Um, it's not just reading information and um, moving on. Uh, in this next example, the nurse tells the learner what she's going to do for her post-fall assessment. She's, got, she's there with the patient on the floor. Um, and she's going to do the post-fall assessment and talk about what she needs to do next. Um, and there's no sound in this learning module. It's all reading the dialogue for several reasons. One, sound makes it really tricky to do um, on the hospital computers, but two, you can read faster than you can listen. And then there are other ways you can present information through charts or through images, just like this for central lines. So here you see the learners observing two nurses talking about CLABSI rates and how they can bring the CLABSI rates down. <clears throat> so you'll see several interactions between two nurses, two a nurse and a patient, um, all throughout the game. That's the Joint Commission Surveyor. He comes around several times through the game. Um, but this is an example of an achievement badge. So this is a bonus achievement. Um, you're presented with a case study and you've got to answer the question correctly to earn your badge. With the bonus badges, you only get one attempt to get the question correctly, correctly answered. If you don't, then you don't earn the badge and you just move on. Uh, and then, The learner will go through, read these answer choices, click on what they feel is the correct one, and then you can see that they ended up earning the badge and it'll light up there at the top of the screen. This is an interaction between a nurse and the patient. This is the one I was telling you about how he is a post-op patient needing to take his catheter out, but he doesn't want to because he doesn't want to get out of bed to pee. Uh, so he asks her if he can leave it in and she gives him all the reasons why it's not safe to leave it in and all the other options he can do, like use an urinal. Um, and then at the end, once you pick up all the hearts, you get your completion code, you click OK. That completion code is entered into Net Learning, and that way there's a digital footprint that you can put on the module. So let's talk for a minute about the planning process for developing an educational game. The first step is brainstorming, and this is where you think about what you want to do and you jot down all your ideas. Consider the, the educational needs of your staff. So does your quality improvement data show a gap in practice? Uh, is the gap in practice related to a lack of knowledge? Because if it's a problem with systems and processes and not knowledge, then it's, it's not going to be addressed with education alone. And then another option is, are you rolling out a new device? Are you changing a policy or procedure? Those are all ways you can figure out what the learning needs of your staff are. And then you just want to jot down all of your ideas for your topics and then the type of game you want to make. What's the title of the game? How do you win? Can you lose? What are the rules? And this is a very messy, of course, color coded because that's my type A personality, chicken scratch brainstorming notes that I took when I first started planning this game. And then just like any other educational intervention, you've got to make an instructional plan. You've got to create learning objectives. And a big mistake educators make in game-based learning is getting so caught up in making the game that they neglect the learning part, the, the very reason why we're here. So when you hear stories of game-based learning failing, often that's what happened. So you need to write your learning objectives using Bloom's taxonomy to help you. Don't lose sight of the fact that you're an educator. So a game design document is a document that I refer to as my brains when I was developing the game. I use this free template from Trix Gaming Studio. It's not a game-based learning website. It's a game development website. But it's a really great tool. It's like 16 pages long, and it, it includes stuff like project develop descriptions, 
the title, the characters, the storyline, the theme, what game mechanics you're going to include, what user skills they're going to need, how do you win and lose, music and sounds. Um, for simple games, this might not be necessary, but for me, this complex level of the game, I had to have a document to keep me, keep my brain straight. And in addition to just the general notes that I took in the game design document, it was very helpful for me to have a map of my game like you see here. And in the map are all of the items that are placed, the badges, um, where the nurses were, where the patients were, and then where each learning activity would take place within the game. So at a glance, I can make sense of this document um, and see how my game relates back to the instructional plan, which was really important. And so then once you have all that done, you circle back to your instructional plan um, and you make sure that you have learning strategies for each objective. Um, you can write the content in Word or maybe in a PowerPoint. That way you can organize your thoughts and then uh, one of the problems with a lot of the gaming software is they don't have a spell check and it's kind of hard to see. It's easy to make typos as you're typing. Uh, so if you write all of the content ahead of time, you can spell check it in Word or PowerPoint and then you can copy and paste it into your game. Um, and if you're using multiple choice questions for your assessment, I would type those in a document as well. You've got to have the uh, rationales and the correct answers in there too. Um, we talked before about having random technical issues. One of the things that you can use this um, PowerPoint or Word of the content or the testing is to use it as a backup in case your technology fails. So let's say worst case scenario, your game crashes, you need to get these learners, you know, completing the educational module soon. So you can use the backup PowerPoint with the backup test if you need it. Not ideal, but at least you have a backup plan. So building a game, you have to decide on what type of platform you're going to use, and I'll tell you just a little bit about platforms in a minute. Um, but once you decide on that, if you're building a game from scratch, you need to learn the platform first. So what I did was I would just decide I wanted to build a virtual hospital, and then I would Google, how do you build a virtual world? And then I would go through all these t tutorials, and then I would build it, and then I would have to go to the next step and Google more tutorials. And it's just a very inefficient way of doing things. So I would suggest learning the, the platform before you start building. This project did go through both Purdue and Lifespan's IRBs. And if you're interested in doing any QI project similar to this or otherwise, you, you will probably have to go through the IRB. I think you will be surprised what QI projects technically should go through the IRB. And your lifespan IRB can send you a document they have that helps you answer the, what types of QI projects require IRB approval. It doesn't get very much lower risk than this project, but it still needed IRB approval to protect the human subjects. So. Um, we plan to roll out our project in three orientation groups at regularly scheduled orientation. So we offer the RNs the opportunity to participate. We go through the informed consent. The nurses take the first formative assessment, which is kind of like a pretest. It's how they perceive their existing knowledge. And then they complete the game-based learning module, and right after, they take the second formative assessment. We're using the Student Assessment of Learning Games tool, which is an online tool. It was created by a chemistry teacher. It's been validated, and it evaluates the students' perceived learning gains and also their perception of the course. It's all online, it's free, and it can be modified so that it can fit a variety of courses, which is really very nice. Um, the pre-intervention formative assessment is looking at what they already know, and it uses all ordinal data. There's no narrative sections in the pre-intervention one. It's a pretty quick, pretty quick step. And then the post-intervention formative assessment collects the same ordinal data after the learner completes the module to see how they're learning, how they view their learning gains. Uh, 
Um, and there's also a section in the post-formative assessment that talks about how the class helped overall. So six weeks after the nurses complete the module and the formative assessments, they receive a survey via email to see what their perception of the course is and how they've applied what they learned to practice. That's going to be the summative assessment. And so there's two sections in the summative assessment. There is the part about how they perceive their learning gains over time. And then there's also a part about how the class helped overall. And then the two formative assessments will be compared to assess immediate learning gains. And the post-intervention formative assessment and the summative assessment will be compared to look at learning gains over time. Because um, we're using ordinal data, but we're also doing narrative questions as well. So the ordinal data is going to be analyzed with descriptive statistics, percentages, means, and medians. And then the narrative questions will be analyzed for common themes, outliers, how they support or don't support the findings. And so you, you notice I'm speaking of this project in the future tense. We were supposed to begin orientation with this November orientation group last week. However, we ended up getting delayed. It, it breaks my type A personality a little hard, uh, but we did have to delay it until the December group. We had a lot of things going on with IT, with the IRB, and with key players in the project um, being out of work for a few weeks. So we are going to roll this out in December. We expect to see positive learning gains. Um, we hope that the learners will perceive this as helpful and that the learning gains are retained over time. So let's talk about cost, because of course everyone cares about cost. This, the cost of this project ran us about 75 bucks, and the only reason why it cost anything at all was because we wanted to make it um, a continuing education credit. So the $75 was just for the CE. The um, resources that we used were, were all free or existing. Uh, but again, for me, there's a lot of value in staff time. And building a game-based learning module like this, the way that I did it from the ground up, will never be doable from staff alone, with staff alone. There's just never going to be enough time. So if you wanted to do something like this, you would either have to have a graduate student who can do it for you, uh, or you could purchase some kind of software that makes game development really fast. But of course, those cost money. <laughs> Figures, right? Um, if you wanted to do something like this in your facility and you want to use the game that I built, I am happy to share all the files, whatever you want. I am not for reinventing the wheel. You can use my IRB packet. You can use the literature review for reference the formative and summative assessment tools. I have given you all handouts with my website on it. You can go there and download a bunch of free stuff. Um, so more than willing to share. I will say that if you do want to use the module I made and change it, you're still gonna have to have some knowledge of the Unity platform. Um, so it's not like you're just gonna be able to easily change it to suit your needs. You still are gonna need some sort of training in it. Um, okay, this is what I consider to be the really fun part, practical ideas for digital game-based learning and nursing staff development. Uh, gamification is a word that differs slightly from game-based learning, although some people mistakenly use it interchangeably. In gamification, games not be, may not be a teaching strategy at all. Rather, the gaming mechanics are used to support other teaching methods. Um, and it, gamification doesn't even have to be in education. It's used a lot in business and retail. Can anybody think of an example of game mechanics uh, in the business or retail world? What about Starbucks? If any of you go to Starbucks, you can register your gift card with them. And when you buy coffee, you earn stars. And then after you earn so many stars, you get a free coffee. That's gamification. What about at Shaw's? They have that little Monopoly game. I mean, my husband and I are sitting there using our time after the kids have gone to bed, taping these little Monopoly stickers onto this game board from Shaw's. And it's like, we knew we weren't gonna win, but it's just this, this we just want to play, right? Uh, that's gamification. So 
you don't have you can use that and leverage that in staff development as well without having the gaming as the actual strategy. So how, okay, so what's a practical application of this? So think about making a charge nurse course. Imagine that you set up the charge nurse course like this. Learners earn points for quests through the class and they get their certificate when they achieve a certain score. That's called grading backwards. You start at zero and you have to earn enough points to pass. The highest score, maybe they get a free meal in the cafeteria or they get a candy bar or whatever. You can make, make the reward whatever you want. Uh, learners can earn badges for certain milestones. There might be an achievement for active participation or doing a certain activity. And the activities are immersive and interactive. So let's say instead of doing a PowerPoint about creating a proper patient assignment, I'm sure many of you who have been charged nurses can relate, making a, patient, a fair patient assignment is like solving a riddle that can't be solved. I mean, you're trying to make sure that you're not putting all of your isolation patients together and you're not... You're separating all the crazy patients who are climbing out of bed. And, um, you know, instead of doing that in a PowerPoint format, maybe make a, a fake unit and say, okay, here's your patient list. You've got this many nurses. You've got this many CNAs. Make a fair assignment. And then the, that quest gets completed and they earn points depending on how they did. So that's gamification. You can gamify your entire staff development program by using a learning management system. And as you can see here, there are many LMSs that have gamification elements. I do not have stake in any of these companies. I don't, I've never used any of them, but I just wanted to put this here as a list of reference. You notice though that net learning is not on here. Net learning does not have a gamification capability, um, but these ones do. Classcraft is on there. It's actually not a learning management system, but it is an online program created by a teacher and it's free for educators and it's it's basically adds digital gamification to an in-person course. So that might be something worth checking out. Tools to manage digital achievements. So you can capture learning achievements with badges. There are two fancier tools, Open Badges and Badge the World, are two online programs. They can sync with certain learning management systems to award badges for achievements. Uh, but you don't actually need a fancy program. I teach for Kaplan Test Prep, and they just rolled something out that when you get an award, you're emailed a badge to put under your email signature to show that you earn this award. It's totally free, it's easy, and it gives people recognition that makes them feel good. So in the hospital setting, maybe you're, a nurse got a DAISY award, or maybe they got a specialty certification in med search, or maybe they're an associate degree nurse who got their BSN. You can put those little credentials and make a free badge. There are lots of ways you can make them online. And they can put them in their email signature. And it's just a nice way of recognizing people's achievements. You can design a digital video game from scratch like I did and use its mechanics and content as a learning strategy. I use Unity, um, but there are several other um, platforms out there that you can use. This is a chart that we use to decide what platform. Um, and as I said before, the easier the platform and the less knowledge of coding that you need, the more money the program is going to cost. And so as a graduate student, we just wanted to prove this concept. So I needed free or cheap, right? <laughs> and I was willing to put the time in to do that. However, in staff development, you're not gonna have that kind of time. So um, you have to kind of take the evidence and perhaps maybe you can get grant funding for something that's a little bit easier to use. Or you can find it in your budget somewhere. If you do decide to build something from scratch, there are lots of ways you can learn how to do it. There are free YouTube tutorials that I used a ton of. Um, Udemy and Coursera, you can find online free or cheap tutorials on all kinds of topics. And then there are some massive open online courses. These are, allow anyone to access free courses created by top educators from big universities. And they have topics on everything. So these are three MOOCs is what they're called. Other tools for digital game-based learning. You know, we vilify PowerPoint a lot. <laughs> Here we are, a day full of PowerPoints, right, at a research conference. But 
there are really creative ways to use PowerPoint and make them interactive. This is a PowerPoint Jeopardy I made when I was teaching um, pre-licensor students. We were talking about spinal cord injury, and so I made a spinal cord injury Jeopardy. Um, I have this, this PowerPoint file on my website. You can download the template for free, and you can plug in whatever you want in there. Like I said, anything that you download of mine, feel free to use however you want. Just give credit when credit is due. I don't think... I really believe strongly in educators sharing what they have. Um, I will caution you that Jeopardy is a little tricky because you've got to come up with questions that only have one black and white answer. And that is surprisingly hard to do. Well, perhaps not surprisingly hard to do in nursing because everything is so gray. Um, but it really is a great tool and the students absolutely love doing it. They were kind of begging for more after. So it was a great experience. Another example of a PowerPoint game is Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? It's another game show that's on TV. Um, they are asked a series of multiple choice questions. They get harder and harder the more and more monetary amounts that you get. So when you get to the million dollar question, it's super hard. Um, so you would have to have lots of multiple choice questions in order of level of difficulty. Um, the traditional game on TV only has one player at a time, but you can get creative bridge your learners up into teams. You can take turns answering questions of a certain value. This is, example is used in a telemetry course. So you put a strip up there and you give options on what the strip is. Connect Four and Tic-Tac-Toe are used kind of in a similar way. The learners are divided up into teams and when the team answers a question correctly, they get to place their place marker, either an X or an O, or a Connect Four piece, wherever they want. And the winner in Connect Four, of course, gets four in a row. And in Tic-Tac-Toe, you get three in a row. Tic-Tac-Toe is good for a subject with less questions, perhaps like key points about an environmental safety presentation and orientation. So you can see here, there's an example. How can you identify that an oxygen tank is new and unopened? Well, the needles on the green and the black cap is still on. Um, it's a little bit limited because there's only nine questions. So if you find yourself outgrowing it, you could do multiple Tic-Tac-Toe games or you can move on to the Connect Four format. Family Feud. Family Feud on TV has gone very downhill, in my opinion. It's getting, it's getting very raunchy. But you can make your own Family Feud on PowerPoint for whatever topic you want. And so in Family Feud, the contestants are supposed to guess what the top 100 people surveyed answer to a question. So you would need to craft a question that has like five, four to five, sometimes even three proper answers. So here is a family feud about fall prevention. So something you might do to prevent falls. And in, in the, the game board, you've got non-skid footwear, you've got bed alarms, you've got leaving the call bell within reach, um, keeping the bed, in, you know, uh, the bed alarm on. All of those things can appear in that uh, in that game board, and they're all worth a certain amount of points. If they answer incorrectly, they get an, a red X, and, they, and once they get three red Xs, it goes to the other team, and they get to try answering again. So that would be another fun way of doing that. Let's see. This is a PowerPoint for Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? And in this example, we use Are You Smarter Than a Pharmacist? Um, in fifth grader, they are, um, the group of learners work together to get the questions right. And then a second group are the panel of helpers that can cheat by helping the players answer questions. Um, and so the playing group has three cheats, a save, a peek, and a copy. And this is also based on a TV show. Um, the questions can be open-ended. They can be multiple choice. Um, but you're going to need something with a wide, array, wide range of related topics. So in this example, we've got a whole bunch of questions on anti-infectives. And we've got all different kinds of classes there. Um, you really don't want to use this with any more than 10 learners because it just gets to be too many. This is a tool called Quandary, and I'm going to hit play on that and let you see. It is a tool where you can create your own, you can make your own, choose your own adventure type game. So you have them answer a question. And based on their, on their answer, the next step will change. So let's say, like you see here in this example, um, you select the wrong answer, your patient dies, game over. But if you select the correct answer, it goes on to the next step. 
Um, so it's free. It's an online tool. It could be really valuable for, for you. If I was still teaching in free licensure nursing, I would totally use that. Softworks is a platform that you can use to create interactive digital games, and they have a really cookie-cutter approach, but it's easy, um, but it does cost money. But I, I list it on here for you to check out if you're interested. Quizzes is another free interactive software online that I would totally use if I was teaching. Again, um, you create a quiz, and then you can make game mechanics about the quiz. So you can have a leaderboard, you've got a timer, you can um, play music, and even show memes to have a little bit of appropriate, of course, appropriate memes, um, to have humor. Um, if I, I would love using this. This tool is really very cool. Um, and don't forget about non-digital games. It's not all about using digital tools. This is my daughter playing at the Vermont Teddy Bear Factory this huge Connect Four game. You can play this in the same way that you use the PowerPoint, uh, except for it's getting your learners to get up and move around, which is often a very good thing. Uh, so think outside the box a little bit. Um, the, the possibilities are really endless here. So I end with this quote from George Kuros, technology will never replace great teachers, but technology in the hands of great teachers is transformational. Game-based learning is just another tool we have at our disposal to help us as nurses teach in whatever capacity requ is required by our practice setting. No technology is going to replace great teaching, but if great teachers leverage technology as a tool to further engage their learners, really great things can happen. So thank you so much for listening. Again, um, if you have any questions, email me, go to my website, see what I've posted. There are templates there for all of the PowerPoint games that you've seen, um, there are links to those. Some are free or cheap. Um, and then the ones that I've created, of course, feel free to download it to use however you want. Thank you so much.